So we are coming to land on this series. And, and uh, first of all, I, I just want to say thank you to God and acknowledge God's help navigating through this series. Um, I described, I stood here a, a few weeks back right at the start saying it feels like uh, the start of walking across a landmine. And it feels like, whoa, this is going to be really, really hard. Um, and I just want to thank God for, I think on the whole, navigating us through as a church. Um, it's been really good. I want to thank you as a church as well for your engagement, especially those of you that might not have agreed with some of the things that we've said. Oh, I especially want to thank you for the way that you've not agreed and the way that you've been around in those conversations. I think it's important to acknowledge that. And as we land this series, uh, we hope it's been thought-provoking and helpful. We thought it was right not to land on a particular subject that we've been looking at, but actually to land it on the person of Jesus. And so we tweaked and changed how we're going to land. And so today we're going to be thinking about Jesus as the complete human. The person, the reason why there is a church. The one who died for the church. The one who perfects the church. The one in through who our unity is held together. The one that you and I are called to follow and submit to. The person of Jesus. And so today we'll look a little bit different from the last few weeks. We will be looking at a particular passage of the Bible. There will be far less words from me. You'll be going, oh, because I realise there have been some chunky teaching and some long teaching over the last few weeks. And there's going to be a bit more space for you to reflect and to think and to take some stuff in and to respond. And we will be doing something a little bit different. We will be, after I make each of the three points, we will actually be worshipping and singing. And we'll be singing together, Jesus be the centre. Because this is not just a head thing. Yeah, this is a heart thing. And so we just want to kind of mark that out in worship as we go through this together. So, having said that, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you have a church Bible and you want a church Bible, it's page 1160. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to read to chapter 4, verse 6. So let me read these words. Paul writes this. 2 Corinthians 3, chapter 1. Verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need to, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we're competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much more greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull for to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It hasn't been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And in the first six verses of chapter 4, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. 
Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the mind of the unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Some amazing stuff in there, and we're going to pick our way through this. Three things I want to share with you about Uh, what I believe Paul is saying. And Paul founded this church, he loves this church, just to set a bit of a context, he writes at least two letters to instruct this church, to address sin in this church, and some of the questions that they were writing to him as well. It seems that other teachers, since Paul had set up the church and left, had come in, chapter 2, verse 17, and were undermining what Paul was saying. And they were criticising Paul uh, for his lack of eloquence and uh, that he was a manual worker and he didn't charge money to share the good news. And they were also coming in and saying uh, to this little church, probably maybe 50, 60 people, quite small, smaller than us gathered here, uh, they were saying, you need to kind of add some more Jewish stuff into what you're doing. And so that was the context. And in Paul's response, we see something uh, that I think is really vital about the key relationship between Jesus and the church. And I believe God wants to soak some stuff into our hearts today. So let's go on this journey together. Keep your Bibles open. Who are we, firstly? Who are we? A picture of the church. When was the last time you actually wrote a letter? Yeah, I can't remember the last time I actually properly wrote a letter. Some of us might write cards, birthday cards, some of us still do that. But the whole letter writing thing is sort of gone, isn't it? Uh, For most people, maybe you still write letters of complaint. Maybe some of you, uh, I know, have sort of pen pals that you write and communicate to. That seems a very sort of old-fashioned thing now. But very few of us write today. But in Paul's day, written communication was the main form. It was the main form. And people who would travel from one place to the other would come with, with a written recommendation saying who they were and who sent them. And if letters uh, were sent from someone important, they would often be sealed with a wax and a stamp uh, to verify that they're who they'd come from. And only the person who got the letter was allowed to open that. So the letters were a way to prove that the message and the messenger were genuine and authentic. And it seems here in the context that some people were questioning Paul's authority, suggesting that he actually needs proper letters of recommendation. And so this is what he says, and the Bible has loads of amazing pictures about the church, doesn't it? How we see uh, who we are a bit more clearly. Jesus called us to be uh, salt, flavouring salt in our world. Jesus called us to be visible light, not hidden. I've spoken a number of times in this series about the picture of the church being the bride. In this actual letter itself, we have the picture of uh, 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 the, uh, the church being the temple. Damalola, a couple of weeks ago, talked about the church being the body. If you look back in the passage you've got open, it talks about the church being like perfume. Chapter 2, verse 14. And each one of these helps us see something of the beauty of the relationship between Jesus and ourselves, the church. And so Paul responds and says, The church is God's letter. The church is God's letter, God's living letter. Maybe for those who are younger, maybe instead of letter, think uh, uh, the church is God's uh, thing or God's real or God's Insta story. Uh, Come across it and think about it like that. He says, look what he says, is the church is the living letter written on his heart. This is a church, remember, that has cliques and factions. This is a church that's had pretty extreme sexual immorality. This is a church where coming to the table, the rich weren't waiting for the poor and were actually abusing the poor. This is a church that had its flaws like every church does. 
This is a church that was imperfect, like every church is. But it's a church where there were signs of grace present. And Paul's heart was for the church to better reflect and represent Jesus. I hope that's your heart for Hillview too. So let's look at what he says in a bit more detail in this verse. Have a, yeah, keep your Bibles open so, so you can follow through with me. You can track with, with me as we go through this. A few things about this living letter that I want you to notice. Verse 2. Your lives communicate. Your lives are open. Your church life is an open, visible letter written to the world. Someone famously said, your life might be the only Bible that someone reads. So our lives speak. That's a given. We see that clearly here. The question is, what do our lives say? Our lives communicate. And then look at uh, verse 3. When I used to be younger and we used to get uh, things that weren't bills, sort of handwritten letters that came through the post when I was a child, there was great excitement. And the first thing you ask is, who's it from? Who's it from? And here we get the answer. Look at verse 3. Jesus authors this letter. Christ. And this letter uh, talks about how the church is called to be and live. And it's dictated by Jesus, passed on through Paul. Jesus authors the letter. Jesus authors us as church. And look at verse 3, it continues. Verse 3b, the Spirit of God is the writing instrument. One of the, apart from cushions in my house, which you know I have a, a hate-hate relationship with, pens in drawers that don't work are right up there. You know, on the rare occasion where you need to go and grab a pen and someone's on the phone, you need to write something down and you open a drawer and it's like, ah. Oh, why? Why do people keep pens in drawers that don't work? What is the point? Why do people put them back in the drawer? Who are you? <laughs> I will find you. And here we see that uh, Paul says the Spirit of God is the writing, it's the pen, it's the ink. The Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus itself is forming them, is forming us, is present, is active, is making stuff happen, is causing lives to change is evidence of the new. And look at where this written, uh, letter is written uh, on hearts, verse 3 again. Not engraved on stone tablets, a clear uh, point to the Ten Commandments that were written and given to Moses for the original people of God, but written on human hearts, the centre of who we are, the human heart, not the physical thing that beats, who we are. And so Paul makes it clear, who are we? We are, we are God's letter. We're a living letter containing the resurrection life of Jesus among us, in us. That life has been unleashed on the world and it's not written on stone tablets like the old way and it's not written in ink like was common at Paul and Jesus' time, but it's written in your and my life in our day-to-day -day decisions, in our day-to-day -day prayers, in our love of each other or not. So I ask you and I ask me, what's the message of our life? What's being read individually and as a church? Is it a letter that leads to life or death? What's God been writing in the life of Hillview over the last few years? What's he written in your heart as a result of this series? Or maybe like me, in truth, we're wrestling God for the pen, if we're honest. Who are we? An amazing picture of the church. The church is God's letter. We're going to sing together, Jesus, be the centre, before we move on. The words will come up on the screen. We're just going to sing the first couple of verses and the chorus together. So let's sing where we are, staying seated. Thank you. 
That's our prayer. Let's continue. Uh, Again, keep your uh, Bible open. We've looked at verses 1 to 6 in chapter 3, that picture of the church. Uh, And now, should have done that earlier, never mind. Uh, Whose are we? We talked about who we are a little bit, but whose are we? Uh, I don't know if you saw the amazing photographs of the Northern Lights. Uh, I watched the, uh, the news on the next morning and BBC Weather, Weather Watchers had th- uh, put in about 3,000 or, or photographs of, of all these amazing pictures. And the scene was described by the, the weatherman as glorious. That was a great word. It was glorious. And it took me back a few weeks back as well to the, do you remember the, the solar eclipse? And every time there was a report, they talked about, you, ne- you mustn't look directly at the sun, you need to have protection as you look at the sun. And so there's a picture there of people gazing at the, the recent eclipse. So whose are we? Let's think about the glory of the church. As I said earlier, it's likely that some people in Paul's absence had come and, uh, and tried to say that those who were, were new followers of Jesus had to add some other stuff in, some Jewish laws in the mix. And Paul, in, in this particular part of his letter, is showing uh, how the new relationship with God through Jesus is better, more glorious than everything that had gone before and than everything else that's out there. And it's true still today. So he wants us to understand who you are and who we're connected to. So the context in particular of this, uh, these verses, just to get our heads around it, is the Old Covenant and particular Exodus 34. The Old Covenant was expressed through uh, the written law and uh, the stone tablets that Moses received. And Moses, the chosen leader, would go uh, and up the mountain and go and uh, be present and connect with God, speak with God. And after that encounter, his face would, would literally shine. And it was so bright with the reflected glory of being close to Jesus that actually the people were so frightened that Moses had to put a veil on his face until the glory faded. And so that helps us understand a little bit about what Paul's getting at here. He's contrasting that with the beauty and the glory of Jesus. He's leading from from the lesser to the greater, from the shadows to the reality. And you'll see in those verses, he says at least twice, how much more? So let's think a little bit about the glory of Jesus. I put it up on the screen there. In verses 7 and 8, we need to understand the old law brought death but the Holy Spirit brings life. There's the first contrast. He points out what the law only does. The law tells us the standard, and it's unobtainable. The law points out that we can't get there, we can't make it, none of us are good enough. It's unobtainable. No one makes it except Jesus, and that leaves every single human separated and distant. But Jesus has met the standard that we couldn't. He's given his glorious life, literally his glorious life. And then he's given us his life-given spirit so that we can walk with God and in God's ways. The old way brought death. The new way through Jesus and the Holy Spirit brings life. Huge contrast. And then the second contrast we see in verse 9. Failure to keep the law brings condemnation, which is divine rejection. But the new way that Jesus brings in brings righteousness, which means restored relationship. It means acceptance. It means connection with the holy, pure, perfect God. Because Jesus has done what we can't, but what we needed doing because of our sin, through his sacrificial and glorious death on the cross, now humanity is put right. Forgiveness is available. The relationship is restored. Hearts can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do God's will, to live his way. Verse 9 says this, there's no condemnation. Not less condemnation. Not a little bit dregs of condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans, Paul tells us in Romans. Amazing. We're no longer condemned. We're no longer under judgment. We're no longer rejected because of what Jesus has done. We're in this new place of acceptance of right relationship. And in the last contrast we see in verses 7 and 11, the old way fades away, but the new way is forever. Moses' glory faded. 
but there's no fading with the glory of Jesus. It is permanent, it is forever, it is eternal, and it grows in us until it's perfected when we see Jesus perfectly face to face. Maybe an illustration about this will help. It's a bit like a contrast of going outside, maybe in the early hours of the morning, and lighting a candle. Sticking it maybe on a bit of garden furniture you might have out there, or on your patio. And then the sun comes up, and maybe it's a beautiful day like it was yesterday morning or this morning. That's the contrast. What's the point of the candle? No longer needed, no longer required. Something so much more glorious and beautiful has come. The old way has been put in the shade. Paul says. And so for you and I sitting here today, the truth is the glory of the risen Jesus can never be outshone. Lovely to hear Sam saying, trying to fill my life with all these other things. But actually it's Jesus. Paul would have gone amen to that. Paul met the risen Jesus and his life was utterly transformed. Utterly transformed and turned around. He'd seen the glory of Jesus and he was never the same. I've seen that, not in the same dramatic way Paul has. And many people here have. Who's this on offer to? Look at verse 16. This new way, this new life, this beautiful glory, this restored relationship. The answer is anyone. Verse 16. Wherever they're starting from. Whatever their story, whatever their past, whatever their sexual orientation, whatever their race, whatever their culture, anyone. And so how do we connect with this life? Look at verses 14 and 16, two things that come out of that very clearly. How do we connect to this life and move apart, away from being apart from God to being part of the family? Believing in Christ, verse 14. It's a head thing and it's a heart thing who Jesus is and what he's done. But it's more than that, it's trusting in that. It's leaning your weight on that. And verse 16 tells us the other part of that. We turn to the Lord, and that's that picture of repentance. We move away from us being in charge of our life, running around, following our own agendas, doing what we want to do, to Jesus being in charge of our life. And we've talked lots in this series about the authority of Jesus over us. And we mustn't ever lose sight of that. Uh, When I went to pick Natalie up, um, my wife is a teacher, and uh, uh, I went to pick her up uh, last week, and the school had a silent disco, which in my mind is the best kind of disco. Uh, And if you don't know what a silent disco is, um, you have headphones, and headphones are connected Bluetooth to different music, so you can choose to dance to whatever song you want. And it's quite funny watching. I walked past, and I just paused at the door, and you could clearly see there was a whole bunch of people listening to the same song, but there was this one individual with utter freedom dancing and singing and moving to a completely different rhythm. Utterly happy about that. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful picture. What a wonderful picture. And that's what we're thinking about here. You and I are called to dance to a different beat. Our lives are, are, are resound to a different tune. We're under a different authority. We should look different. Full stop. We should look different. I'm not talking about different weird, but countercultural, distinctive. Some Christians are just weird, aren't they? Let's be honest about it. They really are. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. They're just weird. And you get weird people who are Christians, and you get weird people who are not Christians. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about lies. I've gone off piece here. Natalie's staring at me, so I better get back on my notes. Countercultural, different, distinctive, because of our connection with Jesus. And this coming to, to eyes open, it's a supernatural event when a heart becomes soft, when the veil is removed. Freedom comes, we're told. Freedom from divine condemnation, freedom from the power of sin, freedom from spiritual death, freedom to really live as we were always supposed to. Seeing the beauty and glory of Jesus, who he is and what he's done. We don't need a protective screen anymore. We get to stare at the sun, pun intended, S-O-N. The beauty and glory of Jesus face to face and nothing, nothing is ever the same from that moment. Let me just say, that if you've never done this and you'd like to, I would like nothing more than to chat with you or chat with someone else that you know who has. 
And just as we kind of land this point, look at verse 18, please. Again, I'm getting so excited, I'm not doing a PowerPoint or anything. So let's go on to this one. For those of us who have met the risen Jesus, who are now connected to the perfect and complete human, the one who perfects and completes us, we're told here in verse 4 of chapter 4 that Jesus is the exact likeness of God. And so we, we are connected with the one who is supremely glorious, who is amazing, but even more amazing than that, we're told that Jesus shares that glory with us. The awesome, holy God, the one with unapproachable majesty, the one who is the supreme king of glory, is also the one by his spirit at work in our lives to graciously transform us, little by little, into his image. And we see the glory in the complete human Jesus and we're called to reflect that glory to each other and to our world. We gaze on this glory and as a result we're transformed, as this verse clearly says. My daughter uh, Bethany is getting married and uh, she's uh, getting married to a guy called Cam who literally lives the boy next door. He lives next door at church. So, quite a cool story. And um, we've noticed with Bethany that she's spent quite a lot of time with Cam in the last few years, as you do. And we've noticed what we call them camerisms. So, sort of words. I'm thinking, that's not the kind of words we use. Uh, and by spending time with Cam, she started now to speak like Cam. Not quite with a Gloucester accent. We've still preserved the purity of the Southeast accent. <laughs> I knew I was going to get beat up with that one. But the point is this spending time with someone, you become like them, don't you? You pick up some of their traits and their mannerisms. You start to speak like them, sometimes think like them as well. And that's the picture here. As we gaze on Jesus, we become more like Jesus, and, and a defaced image in each of us is progressively made more like Jesus. The complete human completes us. And hear me right, it doesn't just happen. It's not spiritual osmosis. We need active cooperation with God, being open, saying yes to the Spirit of God, dying to self each day, saying, God, fill me, use me. May I follow your agenda and not mine. Doing some of those spiritual practices. I don't know if you've started your fasting yet. Stephen said to me, uh, when I had a conversation with him a couple of days ago, you've picked the worst months for fasting because uh, it's supposed to be until sunset. And sunset gets later and later in May and June. You could have picked winter and it would have been a bit easier. But some of these ways is how we connect, is how we pursue, is how we cooperate. It's a process and it often happens through suffering. So the challenge to us is to see what's really glorious. What do we focus on? What are we gazing on? What are we filling our minds and our hearts with? What captivates us? What do we want to invest our time and our money and our effort and our energy in? We have the picture of the church of who we are. And then Paul points out whose we are. Let's sing again. Jesus be the centre. So we come to uh, land uh, this series and our final point. We've thought about whose we are, 
who we are, the purpose, the picture of the church, that we're God's letter. We thought about whose we are, the glory of the church, the glory of the person of Jesus and our connection with him, how we're called to gaze on him and then reflect him. And then we finish by thinking about the purpose of the church, the purpose of the church, what we call to do. Um, we, spring, we did the spring cleaning uh, a few weeks ago and uh, uh, I was in my element. I was downstairs in the basement getting rid of loads of stuff. I love that. Stuff that had been there, some, some of them decades. And it reminded me of the first time I came to this church and did the spring cleaning. And again, I think it was my, Mike and myself made the beeline down to the basement and there was a, at least two overhead projectors there. And we had a little chat of kind of, in what, what scenario do we imagine that's going to happen where we need to keep the overhead projectors in the basement in case, do you know? We we're trying to imagine these scenarios of what's the world going to become where we go, I know what we need to do. We need to get the overhead projectors and the old acetates back up. That's going to help. And so we, we had quite fun enjoying getting rid of those things. And uh, apologies if, you, if that was yours, you know? <laughs> Just realised that. Um, so th th there's no purpose to them, is there? Time's moved on, the culture's moved on, there's no purpose. That's exactly the opposite of what we're called to do. The purpose of the church remains unchanged from when Paul wrote this letter, from when Jesus came. It's the same as it always was. So look at verse 1 here. Therefore, Paul says, because of that beauty and the glory of Jesus and all that he's done and how, how this new covenant is so much better and more incredible than, than what been before and anything else that's out there, because of that, therefore, we're called to reflect him to others. It's our purpose, it's our mission, it's our mandate, it's what we're called to do. And this is not smoke and mirrors, which is kind of Paul uh, pushing back against the deception of some of these teachers. But it's about signposts and mirrors. So let's, as we finish, how do we work this kind of calling and this purpose out? There's a few things that Paul says in those first six verses that I just want to finish and land with. The first is this in verse one. Don't give up. Don't give up. I wonder what you would say is the greatest challenge facing followers of Jesus today. Maybe you might uh, talk about the rise of strident Islam. Maybe secularism. Maybe in truth it's discouragement for those in the church. The feeling that you want to give up, losing heart, first one. Give up with church. Give up sharing Jesus. Give up pursuing intimacy with him. Give up believing that Jesus still rescues. Just losing heart. Paul says, don't give up. <laughs> Don't lose heart. And then he says in verse 2, be clear, not tricking people, not diluting the cost of either Jesus' sacrifice or what our following looks like, that dying to self. But what changes people is the incredible news of what happened here, who Jesus is and what he's done. And we can't stray from that. We can't water it down. We've got to be faithful to the message of Jesus crucified and risen. That's the glory. That's the glory. And we need to share it plainly, yes, contextually, as Paul did, depending on what his audience was. So we need to be clear at what's front and central. And we also need to be clear in terms of being transparent, having an openness, an integrity, a lifestyle that seeks to match up to our calling, not being different people on Sunday and Monday at church and at home. We're all called to give account. Someone bought me a magnet which said, uh, I've got it upstairs in my office, Jesus is coming, look busy, which I think is quite funny. He is coming, but the point is, he's here now. You know, so we need to get on with what he's called us to do. We don't wait. We're called to give account. We're called to live to please God Monday through to Sunday. We also need to be aware that we're in a battle of the enemy. And I don't want to overstate this, but it's important because it's here. In our mission of reflecting Jesus, we need to be aware that there is a dark power, Satan, and forces that seek to oppose God's light and God's truth. And many sadly ignore Jesus. There is a God of this age. 
There are hostile forces at work preventing people from seeing truth. We need to wake up to that. We need to pray into that. We need to fast. We need to remember that people around us are perishing, as this passage says. There's nothing more important and urgent in the whole of our life's purpose than reflecting Jesus to those who don't know him. Nothing. We need to beware of the enemy and be aware of the battle. And we need to point, as I come to a close, to point to Jesus, to preach and live as Jesus is Lord. One of my favourite signposts is the one that uh, I saw, which said, secret nuclear bunker, with an arrow pointing. <coughs> Go figure. We are called to be a signpost, not secret, but our lives to point people to Jesus. And Paul, in verse 5, makes sure that the focus isn't on him. He is simply someone who introduces people to the top man. That's his job. He understands that. It's a little bit like uh, I used to watch The Apprentice, but you know the person on reception says, Lord Sugar will see you now. You know, that's the one job that they have. That's our job. Point people to Jesus. Point people to Jesus. That's it. It's a very simple job description. It's really hard to do and to live out, but that is what we're called to do, to preach and live and declare in word and action the beauty of Jesus. The light has come into darkness. And that flows itself out, as Paul says, by serving the church for Jesus' sake. The truth is we are under authority. We're servants or slaves, actually, the word is. And this is countercultural, as we've heard in this series. So different to, to a culture that says, it's my rights, I'm entitled, I self-identify as whatever I want. I choose, I choose, I choose. We are servants. We are slaves of Jesus. He is why we do ministry. He is how we do ministry. He calls and equips us. Let me ask some questions. Firstly, are you serving Jesus? Let me ask you a second question. Why are you serving Jesus? How are you serving Jesus? These are all important. We've got to get these lined up. Serve the church for Jesus' sake. And then finally, keep Jesus central. Keep Jesus central. Copernicus was a Polish astronomer who put forth the theory that the sun and not the earth was the centre of everything and that the earth revolves and all the other planets revolve around the sun. It's called heliocentric or sun-centric system. Do you know what the moment we met Jesus, that happened to us? Our lives have now changed their orbit. We are now revolved around Jesus. In Jesus, God has made himself known. Jesus is God's ultimate revelation, the complete human. Jesus is the true and perfect reflection of the one true creator God in whom all human images were made. And if we're followers of Jesus, that means Jesus is the centre of me. It means Jesus is the centre of this church, the head. It means Jesus is the one that we promote. And it's so easy to focus on programs and personalities and secondary issues. Our prime calling is to make Jesus known. To live with, to live for, and increasingly live like Jesus, keeping face-to-face -face contact with him. The glorious, beautiful, complete, human Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, I recognise that we have uttered a whole bunch of words over the last few weeks and months, but maybe none of them was important as recognising the beauty of Jesus, recognising the authority of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus, the victory of Jesus, the glory uniquely that Jesus has. And our prayer is that we would stay with you central, not orbiting around our own desires or plans or what we think is best, but around your desires and your plans 
and what you think is best for us. Forgive us, each of us, when we don't do that. Forgive us when we've lost focus on you. Forgive us when we are serving for different reasons. For where we are relying on our own strength. And Lord, we want to come back to you and say, please, Jesus, truly be central. Truly be the wind in our sails. We submit to you. We commit to you. We want to say we love you. We want to say we thank you for your love for us. Demonstrated so unbelievably, so gloriously through your death and resurrection. We want to thank you for your living spirit. The presence of Jesus in us, animating our life. And would you come now and fill us once again. We are lost without you. We can't live this countercultural, dancing on our own to a different tune life without you. Please come once again and touch us individually and as your church so that others step in to this incredible life. Where we've lost heart, Lord, even now in this moment, would you refuel us? Would you refocus us? Would you come and touch us once again? Lift our eyes up to see your gaze. And fill us with your strength. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We want you to author us as church, so that Jesus is so much more visible than he is now. Please continue to write your will on our hearts and lives. For your glory, not ours. In Jesus' name, amen.